Thank you guys for coming. So continue probably from today and tomorrow, I'm going to focus more on the kind of linear model, the least square case, essentially. So we have this sparse model where only a few variables matter. And the idea is that although we have many more regressors than observations, the fact that only a small number of them actually matters, we can actually recover something interesting. So, and there we discussed lasso in detail. But just to give you a glimpse, since this is a mini course, so if you try to look at the literature, there are plenty of variants of lasso. And all of them achieve similar guarantees. But one variant is just the Danzig selector, which minimizes the L1 norm subject to uh, orthogonality const a near orthogonality constraint between the residuals you are finding, the model uh, minus the observations with respect to the covariates. Or you could also minimize L1 norm subject to the constraint that the noise level of the problem is less than a particular parameter. So you, think you get reasonable good fit, but you find a sparse model up to that. Another possibility would be you find the best fit model subject to the constraint that the L1 norm is smaller than, uh, is constrained. So that's what they call C, this type of estimators. Or different forms, you can minimize instead of the L2 norm square, just the um, L1 uh, without the squares. And so if you choose the penalty parameter properly, you're going to get very similar conditions. Uh, very similar guarantees under very similar uh, conditions. It's just the choice of parameter reflects what you know of the problem. In case of lasso, the choice was essentially sigma over log p over n, some constant. And that essentially tells you that you, you assume you know sigma or you can estimate sigma to actually be able to plug in and, and implement this method. In the case of density selector, it's the same choice. So here, the motivation is that you want to choose lambda such that the true vector becomes feasible for the problem. Once it's feasible, you know that your estimator beta hat has a L1 norm is smaller than the beta not L1 norm. And that's essentially a restricted set argument. In this case, what you want is lambda to be essentially sigma. So, it's, so basically, you find this, the sigma plus some little, uh, little noise, because you want, again, beta naught to be feasible here. And then you are restricted in the restricted set one more time. In this one, what you want is actually the L1 norm of beta naught. And you need to be a little bit precise on this choice. If you make a large mistake here, a small mistake, you lose convergence. So this type of problems, computationally, they're a little bit similar. You might have a preference because some methods you can apply some type of smoothing that you cannot apply in the other one. So there are some computational issues. But depending on the setting, a small change in the penalty gives you a big thing. Changing here by a factor of two, your rate goes a factor of two up. Here, a factor of two just destroys your rate of convergence. Same thing here. Uh, and then in this case, the only f the interesting thing here is that it's similar to lasso. But what happens is that this is our criteria function. This was our q hat of beta. And what we want is lambda bigger than c times the gradient of q hat at beta naught, infinity. Now, the, 
what happens that this is going to be C. What's the gradient here? We don't have the square. So when you take derivative, this term is going to show up in the denominator. So what you get is the gradient of the, least the previous case that we are familiar, but normalized by this piece evaluated at true value. And that is precisely just taking the gradient there. Now, what happens is that this error term now is self-normalized by, by, by the L2 norm of the error term, which means that this choice is essentially C times log P over N. So basically, the unknown parameter sigma no longer shows up there because it gets, this essentially is an estimator of sigma and that kind of washes away. So that kind of gives a, a pivotal choice for these uh, penalty parameters. So this is what I wanted to talk about, penalty choice. Um, and keep in mind that you're gonna find many of those variants in the literature, um, but the bottom line is that the appropriate choice of lambda gives you that your estimator is in this restricted set and then you can uh, apply some modification condition like the restricted angular value. So we have been relying on, on the condition that if delta belongs to the restricted set with some constant C bar bigger than one, look at the minimum of the prediction norm divided by delta t. And this is a sufficient condition that they pass and compass many um, more primitive conditions that one should always be aware of what's the relevant uh, data generating process that you are concerned with. But this is just one of many. Uh, and if you go to the literature, you're gonna see easily uh, 10 different measures that will have similar flavor so one measure that people, that we call just uh, one kappa tilde would be, we just take the minimum over the same set, but now you, you hit this by square root s, and you divide it by delta t one. So you can show that this is at least the previous one and all the calculations goes, goes through because it's what you really need because you're using L1 regularization is something that translates L1 mistakes to prediction norm mistakes. That's the fundament, kind of one fundamental uh, tool that you need. And this is another way to capture. Some other approaches which are more based on, uh, on first order conditions than criteria of functions kind of conditions. So everything I have been doing here, I was working with the criterion functions. Basically the objective function is smaller at the, at the estimator than it is at the true value. Another approach is to look directly at the first order conditions. And there, conditions of the following type actually have been shown to be good. So we actually look at this the L infinity norm divided by uh, delta t. So you can also show that this one uh, is uh, better behaved than uh, the other one. This condition actually also becomes very convenient in some more general settings where you are doing instrumental variables and you have essentially two different matrices. So essentially, you actually have a different matrix here because you're concerned about this cross product and then this type of condition blends well, but in the case of Lasso, 
it will be the same. Um, and another recent one that has been appearing is, okay, there is, there is another one here that you can actually slightly generalize and modify some things to get, okay, there will be many tilde's until I'm done. So here is minimum. Oh, yes, okay. Four, okay. Uh, delta one. Then, so this is one condition that's actually concerned with badly behaved designs. So essentially, these conditions essentially need if you have a direct two repeated regressors, these will give you zero. So this, this type of condition cannot handle the case that two covariates, that you have a repeated covariates. Same thing here, same thing here. So it just breaks down, it just becomes e zero if you have two repeated regressors. Now, here is a different setting because you are taking the difference between mistakes outside the, the support. So if you have a repeated regressor, you don't want only one of them would be in your true support. So you don't really want to put any weight there because that would increase this, uh, this ratio. So that is some condition that starts to get into uh, dealing with bad designs. And another one that I was about to write here is if you only care about prediction norm, um, this seems to be a very good one. And in particular, this is always positive as long as the matrix has full rank. Right? Full rank, I mean the minimum between n and p. So that's. Uh, there's some condition that uh, I'm curious to see how it's going to, to search for good examples that this type of condition cannot, can, can deal with designs that these ones can't. Um, but bottom line, in well-behaved case, which I'm going to give primitive conditions that are going to achieve those well-behaved case, all of them become essentially the same in terms of providing rate of convergence. These ones would be giving you good results potentially in kind of ill posed cases that you should not, should not expect um, to have. So, primitive conditions that are easy to, to understand, and they would imply well behaved conditions, essentially this to be um, bundled away from zero. So one is uh, mutually coherent, coherence. So essentially you ask for the, the correlation between the, the columns to be very small. So essentially if you look at after you normalize every column to have length one, you want all the off diagonals to be, let's say, smaller than one of the order one over the sparsity you want. So that's actually something that's very simple to verify. That makes sense in some applications in, in signal processing in which you can design your matrix X. So you, you have random uh, entries from, from independent Gaussians. Essentially, you should expect that uh, to be the, be the case in uh, as long as S is not too large. Yesterday, we also ha saw the restricted isometry property that uh, for all vectors delta such that they are sparse, has sparsity level S, there is a constant HS such that when you hit this 
the vectors through the matrix X, properly normalized, looks similar then to an identity. And it's not hard to see that mutual incoherence uh, implies RIP. Um, and the ones I typically use when I want to cover more econometric applications are conditioned based on sparse angle values. So the idea is that you define the minimum sparse angle value of order k to be the minimum over sparse vectors up to order k of essentially of the quadratic form associated with x transpose x over n. And you define the, the maximum sparse angle value accordingly. And typically, we're going to pick some k. Um, and to make my life easy, I'm typically going to pick, uh, let's say, s log n. So that the minimum sparse angle value is bounded away from, from 0, and the maximum is bounded away from above. Uh, bad choices. And also, it turns out that all those actually imply that the restricted angle value actually is bounded away from, uh, from zero. Um, I think Roberto did some of the proof of this through some arguments. So I, unless someone actually wants, I would move forward of using these conditions for, new, for other estimators. But it, what? If you. Yes, that's the only thing. To be it matters, yes. So that so and, and this So if you allow rescaling of what? Well, no, but the first uh, rescaling, just risk without diagonal rescaling, no rotations. Right, rotations we, can, uh, we cannot do. I want to preserve the comp kind of the. the yeah, and then I think it's going to play a role with the noise. All these things, they're going to interchange. But I, um, so. Yeah, okay. I mean, okay, if you rescale, then you rescale the noise, that's good. But they are similar. Um, they, they, these two, I've, I can see how, what you're arguing. My, my point also on these primitive conditions is that when you think about an application that you want to cover, you need to essentially provide some conditions that's 
seems to mimic that the data generating process. And these ones seems to impose strong conditions when I think about economic indicators. Right, so these. I need both. I'm already, I already rescaled the matrix, right, to have diagonals one, kind of the length of the columns to be one. So that, that is fixed. Yeah, it needs to be bigger. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. No. It's, so it's just actually, in terms of even communicating assumptions, at least for so for econometricians, which are very peculiar uh, audience, I need to justify very clearly the assumptions. This is a much easier assumption to justify than the previous one. It's just the way. Yes, uh, especially. Independent of n, as n grows. So I agree that if you make it different, uh, make it different, then you have they are the same. Yeah. Um, these conditions are going to be uh, suitable for what I'm going to discuss next, which is post last estimators. So the idea here is that um, basically Lasso is doing this model selection and estimation of the coefficients. And it's not clear that's the best thing to do to do the, both of them together. So once you select the model, you might actually want to refit the model. And this seems to be a very common practice. So at least to understand what this procedure that people do a lot, which is refitting the model, it makes sense to understand this, uh, this estimator that you run least squares. On the making sure that you only use the components that were selected by Lasso. So that's the estimator. I run Lasso, get my beta hat, see what is different than zero, and then I refit a least square all using those components alone. Um, now, the important thing here, it's, again, goes back to your application of interest. So I'm particularly interested in the case that Lasso does not select the true model. So I'm particularly concerned with the case that I made mistakes, and then in the second step, I misspecified. I do not have the true model as an option anymore. Uh, and it turns out that unless, um, unless you make many more, assu more assumptions, and by that I mean some irrepresentability condition which is of the form is an assumption on the design so here I'm constraining my matrix to be on the the columns to be on the set true support and outside the true support. And here is a condition that blends the sign of the unknown parameter 
this needs to be less than one minus some eta. But unless this holds and lambda is much bigger than one over this eta times the traditional level. And the minimum coefficient in the that is different than zero in the true model. This is much bigger than lambda. So I need these three conditions. Unless these three things hold, Lasso typically will not select on the model. And this is a hard condition on the design. This makes my penalty choice to depend on this particular select parameter. And this typically will lead to huge penalties. So I have some concerns with that penalty in practice. And on top, I really do not like the conditions that impose separation from zero. So that makes perfect sense in when you can control design, you can control the signal you're transmitting. But in other applications that I can, I simply receive the data. I, I do not have any control, which is typically the case in econometric applications. It's hard for me to justify this very nice separation. Typical regression functions that have been estimated in, in, in econometrics, the typical assumption that those are smooth functions and then it can be approximated with some basis. So those coefficients typically decay to zero. So I will never achieve any separation from zero. My, my model is going to be fully dense, but there is a good spot approximation, but there is no separation from zero, essentially. So I'm not really willing to assume that. So I want to analyze this model without uh, perfect model selection. So in that case, to understand this property, the first thing we can notice is that this beta tilde minimizes expression. So we have 2n y minus x beta tilde square. It, it cannot be smaller than this evaluated through model because I might have made mistakes. But what I know for sure is that since I'm using the full support of lasso, it fits the data better than lasso. That's the, the first observation. At that point, I can subtract from both sides the fit of the true model. And then by optimality of lasso, lasso minimizes lasso minimizes precisely this sum. So the fit of lasso plus L1 norm of lasso is less than the fit with the true model and the L1 norm of the true model. So this difference is upper bounded by lambda beta hat, beta not one minus lambda of the L1 norm of lasso. And then we can do the similar manipulations that we did before. I can even throw away the part associated with the uh, mistakes outside the true support. But now this piece, because I'm restricted to the set T, has a nice sparsity. So this is lambda square root S. And then we can apply the restricted angle value condition. If beta hat is in the nice support. So essentially, I'm going to be assuming that we are in the nice case that lambda is bigger than C x
So the same assumption I did in Lasso, I'm going to make it here. So these assumptions tell me I chose a good parameter to select my support. If I don't have this, I don't have the good guarantees of Lasso. But if I have that, I know that beta hat minus beta naught belongs to the restricted set. So this is bounded above by the prediction norm mistakes of Lasso divided by the restricted Gingo value. I'm essentially, I'm using the fact that Lasso has good properties to select the model, but also for rates. Now, this we have a rate from that side. We have the, the rate of Lasso, which comes only from, from that condition. And the rate is 2 times 1 plus 1 over C. And the same term here, so we got square. So that takes care of one side of this. Now let me look at the other side. So the other side now. Right, so the other side, well, y minus beta naught, x beta naught is just the error term, so that's just 1 over 2n, epsilon minus x beta hat minus beta naught square minus square 2n. Let's equal to. Minus x minus Sorry, here is beta two then. So those cancel. And now I can see a bound for the rate of the uh, post lasso. So x of the prediction norm, beta 2 to the minus beta naught over 2n. This is smaller than, I will take this to the other side and do hold the inequality there again. So we get x transpose epsilon infinity over n. Plus that that bound, which is uh, two one plus one over c lambda square root s over kappa. We are under the event that this is bounded by lambda over c. So this gives us lambda over c. This is a L1 norm. I want to convert to L2 norm. The sparsity of beta naught is S, and the sparsity of beta tilde is the sparsity of lasso. So I will <coughs> denote the sparsity of lasso to be S hat. So this is square root of S hat plus S times the L2 norm, beta tilde minus beta naught plus and c is bigger than 1, so this is just a 2 at most, so it's just 4. Lambda square root s square. So we get c is bigger than 1, so we're going to just get rid of it for now. Lambda uh, square root s hat plus s. 
And then here, I'm going to use this sparse angle value condition. So this is at most x beta tilde minus beta naught divided by root n, but divided by square root of phi min s hat plus s. So essentially, I have this piece here, this, which is the square root of eight is on the other side. So just using that a square less equal than a times b plus c square, that implies, for positive numbers, that implies that a is less equal than b plus c. So we get x beta tilde minus beta naught by square root n. So the prediction norm for post lasso is bounded by, there is a two there, so that needs to go to the other side. Two lambda square root of s hat plus s divided by square root of phi min s hat plus s plus two becomes a four lambda. Uh, so that Two that give me eight. Yes, four works. Square root s over. So what is the expression here? Um, two terms. The first term is actually a variance term. It's kind of square root of a variance term, which is dictated by how many components you have. This bounds the noise, so that gives you uh, the one over root n times some square root log p factors, but also depends on how many variables I have. If s hat is much bigger than s, it kicks in here. And the other term is, uh, is the bias, my mean specification bias. I might have made model selection mistakes, and they are all captured here. That term comes from that side. I used beta hat here to, con to control my mean specification, but if I knew that the true value was into the mo in the model I selected, I could have put beta naught here, and then this would be zero. So I'll have no mean specification bias. But in general, we have a this controls mean specification bias. So the analysis of post lasso now boils down to sparsity. If I have good sparsity guarantees, this could give you, give you good rates. If I don't, I cannot have good rates. So let me try to show now a sparsely bound for lasso. And I do not want to assume those, right? So those, those are not going to be assumed. Yes. Right. Yes. In which case, first, yes. This second term will drop. What? This drops. This. Yes, you go back to the uh, to the least squares, and and uh, as I'm gonna do it, as I'm gonna try to convince you. Ne uh, on the next uh, lecture tomorrow, if you have a model that selects our selects of probability one, the true probability going to one, it's a bad method. It's actually a highly fragile method. So that's the um, kind of the, the flip of that the type of assumption. So, um, so to try to derive sparse bounds, the way people approach the problem is to go through the first order conditions. So what happens that if you look at the lasso problem, we know that zero belongs to the subdifferential at the two values, so which means that zero belongs to x, y minus x beta hat 
over n plus lambda times the subdifferential of the L1 norm evaluated at beta hat. I'll put some abuse of notation there. So this is uh, nicely understood. This is smooth. The other one is this kink function. So what happens there is that if, if beta hat j equals 0, the subdifferential of the absolute value is anything in the minus 1, 1 interval. But if beta hat j is different, in, is different than 0, then the, the subdifferential is just the sign of beta hat j. So let's look at the components selected by Lasso. So take a component there. That means the subdifferential for this piece on that component needs to be the sign of beta, beta, j, beta hat j, sign of beta hat j is this part. So 0 equals x y minus x beta hat over n. So essentially we have lambda sine beta hat j. Okay, I can do yes equals to minus x y minus x beta hat over n for the jth column. And if I look at this whole support selected by Lasso, I can write this matrix type of uh, rotation. And then I can take L2 norm on both sides. So what I get on this side is just lambda times is a vector of all ones where the ones are precisely on the support of lasso. That's a vector of s hat components equals to 1. That gives you a square root of s hat. And this is equal to x t hat n. Now, we just do some uh, triangle inequality, x y minus x beta naught plus x x beta x minus beta naught. And then this is essentially just the error term. But I know I have only s hat components here. So let me just take the maximum of every row and multiply by how many components I have. So it's going from the L2 norm to the L, to the L infinity norm. That would, then I have the, the other term. And then let's make it even looser by just removing the, the t hat, so it's a maximum of all of them. But then this piece, if we make, if, since we are using the assumption that uh, Lasso was, is, is well behaved. I, I chose properly the penalty level. Yes. It just, yes. Yes, yes. So this is lambda over C from that condition. It's a further bound. 
and then here, so here I'm getting, I'm picking S hat components of these uh, S hat columns from the matrix X. So this lets me further bound by the soup over delta, which delta are sparse vectors of order of S hat X. So this provides me with an upper bound. So I, I only need to look at sparse uh, vectors to be able to account for this potential selection here. And of course, when you're going to use the concept, it's gonna, you're going to erase it. So this term, I'm going to take to the other side. I have lambda, I have lambda over C. So that is the crucial uh, event to guarantee that you can obtain a nice bound for, for S hat. And now the other term. So here I'm going to do cauchy schwartz from this vector to the other vector. So that gives you, sorry, what? No, no, no. This term I take to the other side. Yes. Sorry. I'm very sorry. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, uh, so, soup over delta x, let's put x over n delta. Delta, let's see, could do S hat times, then here becomes X beta hat minus beta not over scaruta. So this is the rate of convergence of loss itself, and this is just phi max of S hat. You, you, you definitely actually here, you actually do, this is, you actually have that here. Because that comes from the definition of the L2 norm there. Yeah. From, the, from the dual. Well, yeah, but yes, yes, it's, it's, it's indeed, it's not an assumption, it's my slopness. Uh, and this bound we actually know from what we did before, 1 plus 1 over C, lambda square root S over kappa. So in the end of the day, we have square root s hat less equal than some quantity that depends on the design, some, some constants. Turns out that when you take this to the other side, you actually get uh, C bar just by doing, uh, yes, you get C bar times square root S. So you, and now there are a couple of ways to proceed, and I'm running out of time. Um, one way is to sh say, well, because I still have S hat on the right hand side. So one way is to say, well, S hat is less equal than P. And then you have your, your bound depending on the maximum, spar maximum angle value of the whole matrix X transpose X. Okay, so that's what it would be. Um, so it would be if using S hat less equal than P gives you S hat less equal than lambda, lambda max 
of x transpose x essentially over n divided by kappa to c bar square root s. And then in many situations, this maximum angle value, if you have p bigger than n, you should expect this to grow. And so these will give you some extra factors on top of the s uh, factor. Another way to proceed is to say, um, OK, so we have that. And so the argument now goes, let's define a set M of integers M such that M is bigger than 8 c bar square phi max of m over kappa c bar square times s. So take all indices there and suppose S hat belongs to, to M for now. Those are the big, big, uh, will be big, uh, not very sparse. If that's the case, uh, so what, so, so, yeah, to take any M in this, in this index, and and now, so what's, what's, what's and suppose s hat. So now I got confused. Now I got confused. I got confused. This piece. Um, oh, that's fine. Okay. Okay. So. So and take any m in the set and suppose s hat is <coughs> equals to some l times this m with l bigger than one. Right, so it's kind of above uh, above that. So basically, I want we know that s hat is less equal than max of L M and now I'm yes and that is bigger than one yes 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 uh, so so we have s hat here and then we have two c bar square root s, and this over kappa c bar c bar. Now, this is phi max s hat over m times m two c bar square root s. Kappa C bar, just multiplying both sides. And now I'm going to use the fact that this is bigger than one. So, which means that since that, so phi max is actually uh, L K is less equal than 2 L phi max of k. Subadditivity of the maximum sparse angle value. Since this is bigger than 1, I can further upper bound it by this hat is equal to square root of 2 s hat over m phi max 
of m now times 2 c bar square root s over kappa. Did it make sense? So I will assume, so I pick m in the set and assume s is bigger than, than, than that m, in particular by some, some whatever factor. So this expression for s hat, I'm just dividing and multiplied by m, so it's the same thing. But now I know this factor is bigger than one, I can pull, pull it out. And the two is just a very conservative factor, actually. It just should be essentially the ceiling of L. But that uh, becomes convenient for me. So let me take out the square root. So we get s hat less equal than 2 s hat over m phi max of m. 4 c bar square over kappa c bar square s. Now, these guys cancel, and I get m is less equal than 2 phi max m 4 c bar 2 over kappa 2 c bar s. And my definition has should be a strict inequality, something like that. So that gives us a contradiction, because I started with m in this set. So I know that s hat is smaller than, uh, than m. So the bound that I can get for s hat is actually, so after taking these squares, is uh, 4 c bar over cap square, cap square c bar. I have s, and the minimum over m in this set times uh, phi max of m. Why is this good? Well, what happens when you look at this set? And if you're willing to assume, for, inst for instance, that phi max of s log n is bounded by a constant. OK, so we have this some type of design. Basically, this is what a constant. This is a constant. This is s. So I have phi. I just want what? Yes. So essentially, a multiple of s will, make, will be in this set. And then I know that there will be constant time s here, and this will be a bounded factor. And then we get it up to a constant that is of the right order of s. Right. Um, then it's a potentially a big con constant, but gives you the, the right order with respect to, uh, to s. One my question, do I need to have phi max in here? So this kappa comes from rate of convergence. So if you change how you measure rate of convergence with different identification conditions, you can get rid of it. But I want to argue that some notion of phi max needs to be there. And one simple case is the case of all regressors are the same. If all regressors are the same, actually you have a beautiful rate of convergence in, in, some, in some cases, because it's equivalent to have only one variable. So you can get very nice uh, rate of convergence. So this is, is great. This would be the right thing. It would be like 1, one over n. That would be the rate of convergence here. But there will be not there will be a sparse solution, but there will also be a very dense solution. Lasso cannot differentiate between all of them, it will be multiplicity of solutions, so you could put one over kind of P on every single one, and this being captured by this. Then the phi max will be square root in the, those designs, phi max is square root of the uh, dimension, and then the bound becomes uh, uh, loose. So some notion of
of that needs to kick in. Just to, to let you guys go, looking at that, we have that x beta hat minus beta naught over square root n is at least 1 minus 1 over c lambda square root s hat over square root of phi max of s hat, which, which we know is at most of the order s. But what we showed before was that the rate of convergence was 2 times 1 plus 1 over c lambda square root s hat, the square root of s over kappa. So when you have a very well-behaved design, that this is bounded away from 0, that the components are far away from 0, and the phi max is well controlled, those are essentially uh, tight. Right? They, be, they, they become very, very uh, close to each other. Right? So, and that tells you that lasso is all about bias. Right? It's really all about picking lambda, and we have upper bounds and lower bounds that essentially match. On those, in those well, very well-behaved designs. That cannot be the case for post-lasso. Right? So for post-lasso, post we cannot derive such bound that would always hold. But lasso, the lower bound, we know that even if we select the right variables, we, under, we underestimate them. So for every one that you pick, you are underestimating your pain a little bit. So that gives you this nice. Uh, and then I apologize for being five minutes late. Thank you.